On August 7, 1942, the USS North Carolina became the first battleship to engage in a U.S. invasion. With her 9 16-inch 45 caliber guns pointed at the beachhead off the waters of Guadalcanal, she provided shore bombardment before the Marines stormed ashore. Having just arrived in the Pacific and being the first battleship to enter Pearl Harbor since the attacks, she became part of Task Force 61, composed around aircraft carriers Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp. Her shots were the first from a U.S. battleship in World War II. This would also be the first U.S. invasion of the war, taking place two months and one day before the U.S. supported invasion of North Africa in what would be known as Operation Torch. Shortly after the Battle of Midway, U.S. reconnaissance aircraft noticed a Japanese airfield on Guadalcanal. There are two reasons that the airfield was concerning Allied leaders. One, Guadalcanal lies directly in the path of the U.S. shipping lanes towards Australia. If the Japanese had finished the airfield, the shipping lanes would falter and Australia would be left to fend for itself. Two, medium-range bombers from the Japanese Air Force or Navy could use the airfield as a possible staging ground for the invasion of Australia. In turn, the airfield in Guadalcanal would possibly lead to the fall of Australia to the Japanese, which could mean Japanese victory in the Pacific. Due to the lack of support from the British Navy and Army in the Pacific, the U.S. armed forces were basically on their own to take on the Japanese on Guadalcanal. This would be a rare occurrence where all four branches of the U.S. military had an active role in the campaign. The Army was involved in the cleanup operation, the Coast Guard transported troops, the Marines fought land battles for most of the campaign, and the Navy defended the island from Japanese reinforcements and provided cover fire. In the morning hours of August 7th, 1942, Battleship North Carolina, nine heavy cruisers, two anti-aircraft cruisers, and 31 destroyers started to bombard Guadalcanal. When the sun began to rise, the North Carolina and other gunships pulled out, so U.S. warplanes from the three U.S. aircraft carriers could continue bombing the island. Later that morning, U.S. Marines from the 1st Marine Division landed on the island. At first, many believed capturing the island would be a piece of cake and would last a few days. Instead, it wound up lasting for six months and two days, making it one of the longest campaigns in World War II. The Japanese were slow to respond as they underestimated the size of U.S. forces. This created the impression that Japan would not reinforce the island, so the U.S. Navy sent its carriers out to sea and away from the action. This ended up being a good thing, as the Japanese sent a task force to reinforce the island and would later be known as the Tokyo Express. Had they been present during the Battle of Savo Island, they most likely would have been sunk. At this point in the war, American carriers were still fighting strictly in daylight, so they would have been defenseless in the nighttime battle. During the night of August 8th and 9th, the Tokyo Express ran right into a patrol of U.S. and Australian warships. The resulting battle, known as the Battle of Savo Island, would cost the U.S. three New Orleans-class heavy cruisers, Vincennes, Astoria, and Quincy. This would just be the first of many confrontations around Guadalcanal and later lead to the waters off Guadalcanal being called Iron Bottom Sound. The name comes from all the vessels that were sunk during the campaign. On August 21st, two of the Japanese fleet carriers that were absent from the Midway attacks, twin carriers Shokaku and Suikaku, along with light carrier Ryojo, were sent to escort Japanese reinforcements. Around this time, on the American side, the USS Wasp was sent south to refuel, leaving Enterprise, Saratoga, and the battleship North Carolina and a handful of cruisers and destroyers to guard Guadalcanal. On August 24th, 1942, the Japanese launched a major raid on the two carriers. Due to a major malfunction on both carriers' radars, they did not pick up the Japanese planes until they were almost over the task force. Bill Norberg, one of the Enterprise mail clerks, recalled that nothing much was happening. He went to the supply store to play a continuation game of checkers with another shipmate, Paul Miller. Miller was a store clerk from Omaha, Nebraska, who had a widowed mother back home who was praying for a safe return. As they played, the general quarter alarm rang. Norberg went to his battle station near the bridge of the ship and Miller went to his station. Miller was part of a damage control party, whose job was to respond to damage when the ship was hit. Miller would never get to do his job as the first bomb that hit the Enterprise struck near Miller's post and killed him and his party instantly. It is unknown how many people were in Miller's damage control party, but the first hit killed 35 men and wounded 70. 30 seconds after the first hit, another bomb struck near a pair of 5-inch guns, killing all 35 crew members. The final bomb struck one minute later and created a 10-foot hole in the flight deck. 
Fire Controlman Harold Smith recalled the anti-aircraft guns fired so fast they burnt paint off the barrels. Also during this time, Enterprise's SBD dive bomber sank the light carrier Ryoju. In total, Enterprise lost 74 men and 95 were wounded, and would be out of action for more than a month due to repairs. During this time, she received new guns. Four quad 40mm Borforce guns, which replaced her old four quad 1.1 inch by 75 caliber guns. By October 25th, she rejoined the fleet with her sister, USS Hornet, to fight the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, which took place from October 25th to 27th. In this battle, the Japanese carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku were joined by two other carriers, the Junyo and light carrier Zuiho. Just like at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, the Americans were outgunned and outmanned, but still made the best show of force. On the first day of the battle, the Japanese launched their aircraft first. The American carriers launched scout bombers some time later. The two forces passed each other, with the SBDs from the Enterprise damaging the Zuiho. USS Hornet's aircraft damaged Shokaku with 3-6 bombs. The battle, however, turned disastrous for the U.S. Navy. At 9-12, USS Hornet began to feel the Japanese wrath when she was first struck by a 250kg semi-armor-piercing bomb, which struck right beside her island on her flight deck. That bomb alone killed 60 men, but it was just the beginning. A few seconds later, a 242kg high explosive struck her flight deck, killing 30 men this time. It was followed by a third bomb which went through three decks and exploded. Luckily, no one was killed when this bomb hit. Hornet's next wound would be a first for a carrier during the Pacific War. At 914, she was struck by a kamikaze, which hit her island and caused fuel from the plane to burn through Hornet's deck. This attack, with two more kamikazes and two torpedo hits, prevented Hornet from launching and landing aircraft, making her dead in the water. This was until the cruiser USS Northampton began to tow Hornet. Enterprise was spared from the first attack by a rain squall, which hid her portion of the task force for about half an hour. After she reappeared, her first crew saw what happened to the Hornet and knew if they survived the battle, they and the Enterprise would be the last battle-ready carrier in the Pacific. Enterprise herself would soon be wounded. She was eventually hit with two bombs that destroyed her elevator at the front of the ship and lost 44 men and wounded 75. There was a fourth kamikaze attack that day and was accidentally caused by an American fighter ace, Stanley Winfield Swede Vedasa, who during the battle became an ace in a day. However, one of the aircraft that he fired at caught fire and then kamikazed into the US destroyer USS Smith. Amazingly, the Japanese main weapon on the plane, a torpedo, survived the crash and blew up several minutes later. The crash itself killed every gunner in the front part of the ship. With fears of losing the ship, Commanding Officer Lt. Col. Hunter Wood ordered the Smith into the massive water wake of the battleship USS South Dakota, which put out the fire. The Smith would rejoin the battle after the fires were out with every remaining gun firing. Shortly after the Enterprise was hit, the U.S. commander of the battle, Rear Admiral Thomas C. Kincaid, decided that if he lost the Enterprise, it could mean the loss of Guadalcanal to the Japanese. He made the painful decision to abandon Hornet and retreat with Enterprise and the rest of the task force. Any hopes to save the Hornet were squashed when she was hit by a second torpedo. It struck right in the middle of the ship, causing uncontrollable fires to break out. The captain of the Hornet, Charles P. Mason, ordered the crew to abandon ship. The Americans tried to scuttle the Hornet, but she proved too tough to sink. Due to the approaching Japanese, the U.S. warships retreated while the Hornet remained afloat. Eventually, it was a salvo of Japanese torpedoes that sank the Hornet. As Enterprise sailed to New Caledonia for repairs, her crew posted a sign up on one of her decks, which read, Enterprise vs. Japan. Unfortunately, in the early hours of Friday, November 13th, another Japanese task force, led by ship Hiei, steamed for the waters off Guadalcanal. She and the other Japanese ships attacked an American patrol force that was patrolling in the waters off the island, which consisted of cruisers and destroyers. The force was led by two U.S. Rear Admirals, Daniel Callahan and Norman Scott. Callahan and Scott made the fatal mistake by having the ships equipped with radar placed in the back of the formations. Had they placed them in the front, they could have detected the enemy warships a lot sooner. However, they did not even see the Japanese until they started to fire on the Americans. Both Callahan and Scott were killed in the battle, and two light cruisers were sunk. 
This would be the first battle in the climatic naval campaign for Guadalcanal, which would last until the 15th of November. On the morning of November 13th, after the nighttime battle was over, USS Enterprise reached the waters off Guadalcanal. She was still under repairs by 75 CBs from Company B of the 3rd Construction Battalion along with crews from the repair ship Vestal who were still on board due to the urgent need for Enterprise. Because Enterprise's Ford elevator was out of commission and cannot be repaired with the limited facilities at New Caledonia, Enterprise struggled with recovering her aircraft. Overall commander of the campaign, Vice Admiral William Halsey Jr. decided to send Enterprise's aircraft to Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, where they would be stationed during the battle. Meanwhile, Japanese Admiral Izoroku Yamamoto sent Hiei and several other battleships and troop transports to recapture Henderson Field. Hiei was later scuttled on November 13th after being attacked by B-17 and torpedo bombers from Enterprise. The next day, Enterprise dive bomber struck and sank seven of the troop transports. On the night of the 14th, Japanese battleship Kirishima approached Guadalcanal, but was surprised by two U.S. battleships and four U.S. destroyers. Under the command of Vice Admiral Willis A. Lee, with USS Washington as his flagship and USS South Dakota and the four destroyers as backup, he sent a fighting message to the fleet. Stand aside, I am coming through. Three of the destroyers were sunk within a few minutes, and the fourth retreated some time later due to heavy damage. South Dakota was also heavily damaged, taking the blunt force of the Japanese fire. This, however, led Washington to open fire without any real opposition. She engaged in a small duel with the Kirishima and caused the Kirishima's crew to abandon ship. She would later be scuttled in the early hours of the 15th of November. In the nighttime battle, 242 Americans and 249 Japanese were lost. Despite coming out with only one undamaged ship, Lee became the only American commander to sink a Japanese battleship with an American battleship in a one-on-one -on -one gunfight and would later be awarded the Navy Cross for this. He also caused the remaining Japanese gunships to retreat, leading to a victory in Iron Bottom Sound. The following morning, the remaining four transports were destroyed by American aircraft from Henderson Field. After this attempt, the Japanese considered the unthinkable, evacuation from Guadalcanal. Operation K was ordered by several high-ranking Japanese officials. The operation was so important, it required approval from the Japanese emperor himself, Hirohito. The plan was presented to him on December 28, 1942. Hirohito approved the plan on December 31st. At the same time, the Americans were sending ground reinforcement to Guadalcanal. To keep the U.S. Navy busy, 16 Japanese G-4M Betty bombers and 16 G-3M Nell bombers attacked the U.S. cruiser USS Chicago. The pilots of the planes were trained to fly at night, something the U.S. Armed Forces were not. On January 29, 1943, at 7.19 p.m., the planes attacked. Chicago's crew made a fatal error. With her guns firing, they let out flashes of light, basically guiding the Japanese bombers to the Chicago itself. The Japanese managed to score two devastating hits on Chicago with torpedoes at 7.38. At 11.35, the Japanese broke off their attack for the time being. Meanwhile, the Chicago sister, USS Louisville, used a big tow cable to tow Chicago from the battle area. The next morning, Enterprise sent warplanes to cover Chicago's retreat. At 8 a.m. on the 30th, the fleet tug USS Navajo took over the process of towing Chicago. For most of the day, Enterprise's fighters kept watch over the USS Chicago. Around 2.45 p.m., Japanese bombers reappeared and fired four more torpedoes at Chicago, all four striking her. Shortly thereafter, the order was given to abandon ship. At 4.44 p.m., the Chicago went down, claiming the lives of 62 sailors. The USS Chicago was the last large warship lost in the Guadalcanal campaign. Shortly after her sinking, Operation K was completed, with around 10,652 Japanese troops evacuated. The operation was completed on February 7, 1943. Two days later, on February 9th, the U.S. Army General Alexander Patch realized the Japanese had left and declared the island secured. The campaign was one of the deadliest campaigns for the U.S. Navy, with 29 ships lost, including the USS Wasp and USS Hornet, 6 heavy cruisers, 2 light cruisers, and 17 destroyers. The campaign also left 7,100 U.S. soldiers dead and more than 7,789 wounded. Japanese casualties were significantly higher. 
The Japanese army alone lost 19,200 sailors, with 8,500 lost in combat. The rest were lost to starvation and illness. They also lost 38 ships, including one light carrier, two battleships, three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, 11 destroyers, and an unknown number of transports. 683 aircraft were also destroyed. The Japanese loss at Guadalcanal led to a chain reaction of the Japanese loss in the Pacific, which wound up costing them the war. This included the loss of Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, famous Admiral Izoroku Yamamoto, who was killed several months after the Americans declared victory at Guadalcanal. The costly battles on the air, land, and sea showed the world that the American armed forces could fight battles on all three at the same time. It is also important to note that throughout most of the campaign, America was still suffering in the aftermath of the Great Depression. There was a lack of enough supplies to adequately fight the Japanese. One example is during the battle with South Dakota and Washington against Kirishima. Four American destroyers, Walke, Preston, Benham, and Gwyn, were chosen due to the lack of undamaged and high-quality ships and because they had the most fuel. Shortly after the campaign ended, America's economy started to boom. Factories that were about to go under started to produce anything and everything for the war effort, from small bullets to giant aircraft carriers. Shortly after the Guadalcanal campaign, Admiral Chester Nimitz started an island hopping campaign, where the Americans would skip over heavily fortified islands in order to seize lightly defended locations that would support the next advance. Due to the major loss at Guadalcanal, especially at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons and the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, the Japanese lost a lot of skilled pilots. Since they lacked the ability to train pilots at the rate the U.S. had, their naval air force suffered. This arguably led to the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot during the Battle of the Philippine Sea. It was during that battle where hundreds of aircraft and their pilots, who were somewhat trained, were lost to American anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes. By the next battle, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese carrier aircraft were used as decoys, it did not play a major role in the battle. Land-based aircraft from both the Imperial Japanese Navy air services and Imperial Japanese Army air services were used in the battle as kamikazes. On May 27, 1943, the USS Enterprise entered Pearl Harbor since she was in dry dock for repairs after the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. The visit was historical, for on that day, Admiral Nimitz awarded the ship and her crew the Navy's first Presidential Unit Citation. The Presidential Unit Citation is an award given directly on the President's behalf to a specific unit or ship. The Enterprise became the first ship in the U.S. Navy to be awarded the honor. The Enterprise's citation reads, For consistently outstanding performance and distinguished achievement during repeated action against enemy Japanese forces in the Pacific War area, 7th of December 1941 to 15th of November 1942. Participating in nearly every major carrier engagement in the first year of the war, the Enterprise and her air group, exclusive of far-flung destruction of hostile shore installations through the battle area, did sink or damage on her own a total of 35 Japanese vessels and shot down a total of 185 Japanese aircraft. Her aggressive spirit and superb combat efficiency are fitting tribute to the officers and men who so gallantly established her as an A-head bulwark in defense of the American nation. The USS North Carolina is most likely the last remaining major warship to survive the campaign that survives today. She is a museum ship in the namesake state of North Carolina and the town of Wilmington. She's been a museum ship since April 29, 1962. The road to becoming a museum ship started after she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register on June 1, 1960. She was initially sold for scrap, however, a man named James Craig saw the success of the USS Texas being turned into a museum ship in her home state and wanted the same fate for North Carolina. He managed to talk to the governor of North Carolina at the time, Luther H. Hodges, who in turn asked the Navy to wait on scrapping the ship. He needed at least $250,000 to bring the ship to the state. With the help of WRAL TV station, which broadcasted a Save Our Ship advertisement campaign in numerous state newspapers, Craig raised more than $330,000, which meant they were able to buy the ship from the Navy. On September 6, 1961, the ship ownership was transferred to the state. Wilmington was selected out of two other cities due to her being farther inland and the less likelihood of damage during hurricanes. 
The waters off Guadalcanal are still considered sacred due to the thousands of allied Japanese soldiers killed in the waters. Every year on the battle's anniversary, a U.S. ship cruises into the waters and drops a wreath to commemorate the men who lost their lives. Every time a ship steams through the waters, strict silence is observed to honor the men who were lost in Iron Bottom Sound. Around 7,100 American servicemen lost their lives on and around Guadalcanal. Most are entombed in the ships off the island. Most were young men who were eager to do their part to avenge the men who died at Pearl Harbor. Others were just looking for a better life that the Navy Marines had to offer. Their sacrifice may have been forgotten, but led to many more men to join the ranks of the armed forces and help take islands such as Iwo Jima and Okinawa. To the men who served on those islands, the men of Guadalcanal served not only as an inspiration to them, but to the marines and sailors who followed. Their overall sacrifice is one that deserves to be remembered.